webcast lecture today, I'm going to be discussing Romanticism and the Romantic Movement, a very, very broad movement in the arts, culture, philosophy and politics that is forever associated with the writings and personality of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. We've discussed Rousseau previously under the heading of political theory because of the importance of his work, The Social Contract. But today we're going to be looking at Rousseau as just one figure in a far broader movement. Rousseau famously said that mankind is born free, but is everywhere in chains. That is the central proposition of Romanticism, that the individual is up against society. Romanticism can be broadly defined as a revolt against received wisdom of all sorts. It's the revolt of the underdog against the powerful, and importantly, it's the revolt of the young against the old in every generation. The first great figure of the Romantic movement, Bertrand Russell says, is Rousseau, but the trends in culture and the arts were already there uh, well before Rousseau's lifetime. Technically, the term emerges as a way of describing a movement in German poetry uh, in the second half of the 18th century. It entailed a revival of the medieval tradition, the Gothic tradition, of chivalrous poetry, Romanesque poetry, and the poetry of courtly love, of, uh, you, you know, maidens in towers and knights going off on charges and, and all of this kind of thing. So this is, this is what gives us the association between Romanticism as a technical term in literary criticism and art history, and the everyday word um, romantic, meaning uh, love and flowers and Valentine's Day. Another factor in that is the association of Romanticism with the cult of Shakespeare. Now, in the period before Romanticism, which the main thrust of it between, say, 1750 and 1850, although it lingers on today, and it's still very important today, far more than lingers, it's still a vital force, but there's a formal period of time in, for example, uh, fine art painting. We would think of it as well within that century from 1750 to 1850. It was a reaction against the philistinism, the, the kind of cold, calculating intellectual life of the Enlightenment, the world of Newton, of highly formal paintings that were done uh, as, almost as geometrical expositions of perspective, of the kind of rather frivolous uh, poetry of, the, uh, of Addison, of Steele, of the, the age of witticism, of superficiality, a kind of cynicism um, associated with the empirical movement, the empirical movement in philosophy. Romanticism is a movement against all of that. It's deeper, darker, more concerned with the emotions, less concerned with the rational conception of the world. As part of that, part of this movement, a revival of interest in Shakespeare. Shakespeare had been banned during the English Civil War, uh, the Puritans didn't like him, and the cult of Shakespeare that was so massive in Victorian times in the later part of the 19th century was simply not there during the Restoration period, the period of the Enlightenment. However, Shakespeare very much in tune with uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the new, dark, brooding feel of the early 19th century popularity of the tragedy Romeo and Juliet, where the star-crossed lovers are thwarted by the conventions of their olders and betters and the conventional morals of their society, which actually destroys them, is an absolutely classic theme of Romanticism and also solidifies the connection between Romanticism as a technical word in art criticism and the history of ideas and the popular idea of romantic as her hearts and flowers because of Romeo and Juliet. With Romanticism, we see the origins of the modern idea of the divided self, a person who on the one hand has a, a side to them which is all about uh, being highly rational, calculating, mathematical, logical, rather cold, uh, rather superficial, uh, looking at the surface of things, and then a deeper, darker side uh, interest with much more emotional, much more passionate, much more extreme, much more seeking out the sublime um, in, in one of the key words of the Romantic movement itself. Now later on we'll look at a, 
a, a German uh, ph philologist and philosopher called Friedrich Nietzsche, who contrasts two trends in European culture since the Greeks. He wrote a, a very interesting book, uh, did Friedrich Nietzsche, called The Birth of Tragedy, in which he contrasts the Apollonian religion of the Greeks against the Dionysian. The Apollonian religion of the Greeks against the Dionysian. The Apollonian religion worshipped the god Apollo at the oracle in Delphi, and the aesthetic of that religion was about light, enlightenment, mathematics, reason. Apollo was also the god of the sun, of, 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 um, of foresight, of looking into the future. Dionysus, on the other hand, uh, also known as Bacchus, is the god of the night time, of darkness, of intoxication, of bliss, of ecstasy, of emotion, of intuition. Um, and, and so these two, in Nietzsche's system, these two principles are always counterposed in European culture since the time of the Greeks. If, you ad if we adopt that system just for a moment, then in the age of the Enlightenment, of Newton, of um, Leibniz, of calculus, of Cartesian mathematics, the, uh, of uh, geometrical architecture, of Mozart. This is the world of refinement, restraint. It's the world of the cerebral mind, the world of the intellect, the world of Apollo. Reacting against that, with Rousseau, we have the world of Dionysus, of subjectivity, of emotion, of passion, of extremism, uh, and that is, I think, a very, very useful way of looking at that. So we get this uh, reaction and counter-reaction between Apollo and Dionysus. So in 1750, Apollo is very much uh, the god that's being worshipped, so to speak, the, the who, who has the uh, spirit of the times. By 1850, Dionysus has come very much to the fore in the intellectual life right across the continent. Another key figure from Greek mythology that helps us understand this movement, I think, is Prometheus amongst the Romantic poets and other figures in the Romantic movement, including Beethoven, who composed several pieces, several major pieces in honour of Prometheus. Prometheus was a titan in Greek mythology before there were humans, there were these sort of superhuman creatures called the Titans. They were giants, they weren't quite gods, uh, and Prometheus was the Titan who in the creation story of the world, according to the Greeks, stole fire from the gods. He actually revolted against the gods and fought them. He stole fire, brought fire down to earth, and it was using this fire that he was able to fashion uh, men, the first men, from clay. So Prometheus was the titan who revolted against the gods themselves. And so the cult of Prometheus tells you a lot about Romanticism, that these are people who are rebelling against every authority, including the authority of God. Mary Shelley's book Frankenstein, which is one of the key literary works, of the Romantic movement is subtitled The Modern Prometheus. Now then the gods punished Prometheus in a particularly vile way. They chained him to a rock and arranged it so that an eagle would come and peck out his liver every day and his liver would grow back uh, and then uh, the eagle would come again and uh, torture him forever for having the temerity to uh, defy the gods by stealing fire. Now suffering and sympathy for those who suffer is an enormous part of the uh, Romantic movement, one of its main themes. And that's the theme I will consider in the next part of this webcast lecture on the Romantic movement. Mm -hmm.